are standing in the outer ward. That is to say we are standing in the area between the inner and outer ballium or defensive wall. The inner wall is over 50 feet high and the outer one is some 25 feet thick. To your left is Mint Street, so named when it was here until the year 1810, that the coins of the realm were both designed and produced. The buildings in house and are known as the casemates or houses within the walls and are now home to some of my yeoman water colleagues and their families. Now behind you, ladies and gentlemen, is a tall, narrow archway next to the one in which you just passed through. This is called a sunny port and was once a royal entrance, but beyond there is a small drawbridge leading down to the Queen's Stairs and directly down to the River Thames. Now rather than travel through the narrow and crowded streets of London, royalty and nobility would make their way down the River Thames in impressive barges, more up alongside those steps to gain easy access to the Tower of London. Those gates that you see round there are original and are some 650 years old. Well, it was here on this very spot that King Henry VIII so lovingly greeted a young lady who was to become his second wife. Her name was Anne Boleyn. She was the mother of Queen Elizabeth I. It was a marvellous day when Anne walked through those gates in preparation for her coronation. Henry was standing just there, sir, just there. <laughs> He turned round and got down on one knee. You don't have to do it, sir. <laughs> he took Anne by the hand and looked lovingly into those dark, dark, raving coloured eyes. He said, Anne, I am my darling. I, King Henry VIII of all England, will love and cherish you for the rest of your life. <laughs> but poor Anne was fated to return some three years later for very different reasons and for a very different gate. But I shall tell you more about her demise later on. Now, to your front is the bell tower. So named because of that small white box on top, which holds the oldest curfew bell in the city of London. For when that bell is alarmed, the gates are closed and locked, the board colours is lowered, and the battlements are manned. It was also sounded to let the population know that an execution was about to take place. Now the bell tower is the strongest of all 13 towers in the inner ward. It stands on a solid base of masonry, some 30 feet thick, 20 feet below ground and 10 feet above. It contains two circular prison chambers, one above the other. Now these are unique in that they're not interconnected with a staircase. Access can only be gained through the lower and upper floor of the Queen's house, which is now the home of the resident governor and his family. Now due to its form of construction, some very important prisoners have been held within these walls. The man for all seasons, Sir Thomas More, one time Lord Chancellor of all England, and good friend to King Henry VIII. He was held in the lower chamber. At the same time, and for the very same reason, John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, was held in the upper chamber. Now, both men failed to recognise King Henry VIII as the supreme head of the Church of England and were to suffer terribly. Sir Thomas More was kept in the lower chamber for 15 months of his life, in the cold and the dark and the damp, until the authorities realised that they could never break his spirit. And so, they took him out to Tower Hill and there they broke his body with an axe. It wasn't until some 400 years later, in 1935, that both of these men were canonised as saints of the Roman Catholic faith. James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth. Anybody ever heard of him? Thank you, madam. For the remaining 200 of you that haven't, you'll never forget his name. It is said that he was the eldest of 13 illegitimate children by King Charles II. On the death of his father in 1685, this young and popular man was persuaded to stake his claim to the throne by virtue of his uncle James II, being a known Roman Catholic. To press home his claim, he landed in the west country of England, moving inland, gaining popular Protestant support on boot in what was to be known as the Monmouth Rebellion. The revolt, however, was crushed at the Battle of Sedgemoor on the 6th of July 1685. And although the leader escaped the battlefield and evaded capture, he was found hiding in a ditch a week later. During his absence, he was sentenced to death. There was no need for a trial. And so three days later, he was taken from here to Tower Hill to be publicly executed by means of block and axe. Well, it was to prove the bloodiest execution in the whole of English history. The executioner that day was a giant of a man known only as Jack Ketch. Now he would use five strokes of the axe to sever that head. But even then, he had to cut through the remaining bone and gristle and sinew and flesh with his very own butcher's carving knife. Yeah. 
Now both hair and body were eventually brought back to the Tower of London for burial here in the Chapel Royal St. Peter Ad Vincula, some 24 hours later. But strangely, it is said that both the head and the body were stitched back together again. I shall tell you why when we go inside the chapel. But in the murder of the two boy princes in 1483, April V and his younger brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester, were brought to the tower by their uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, to prepare for the oldest boy's coronation. The sightings of these two young lads playing in and around the grounds became less and less until they were seen no more. It is alleged that they were murdered by being suffocated with a pillow in the upper chamber. Their small bodies were taken out by an unknown priest the following day and buried in a secret plot underneath a staircase to the south side of the White Tower. There their remains lay for 191 years until the reign of King Charles II when workmen working in that area came upon a small chest. When they opened it up, they was hoping to find lost gold. But all that was in there were the remains of those two small boys. Yeah. <laughs> now it was agreed by experts of the day that they were indeed the bodies of the two young princes. And so they were placed in an urn designed as a Christopher Bed and taken to Innocent's Corner in Westminster Abbey, where they lay to this day. Now another character to be held up there on the top floor was the famous adventurer and navigator Sir Walter Raleigh. He spent 13 years of his life imprisoned in that tower for his alleged involvement in the Lady Arabella Stuart conspiracy against King James I. Now during his imprisonment he fathered a child hmm. and wrote a book, The History of the World, Part 1. Now King James I was not only responsible for Sir Walter Riley's eventual execution, but he hated him and he detested the habit that he had brought back from the other side of the Atlantic. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, we all know what that terrible habit was, do we not? Yes, sir, it was tobacco, wasn't it? And line dancing, and country and western. <laughs> Geoff Rogers William the Conqueror's Norman Keep, known as the Great White Tower. Now, building work started in the year of 1078, and it took 20 years to complete under the direction of Gondolf of Beck, the Bishop of Rochester. They had that tower built over 90 feet high, and the walls vary in thickness, 15 feet at the base to 11 feet at the top. Now on each of the corners you will notice a turret, three of them are square, and one round the back is round. What is in the round one is the first wall observatory is established. Now on top of the turret you will notice a gold crown, underneath which is a weather vane showed a royal standard. Well this lets us know that this is still a royal palace, although no longer a royal residence. But never lose sight of the fact the kings and queens lived here for well over 500 years. Now the royal family lived mainly on the top floor. The floor below that was a banqueting hall, a council chamber, an accommodation for knights and their ladies. It is also the site of the chapel of St John the Evangelist. Now the last la floor with the large windows was mainly for servants and retainers. Yet there is another floor below ground level. Here stores and provisions were kept. But parts of this floor have a far more sinister past. For it is in there that the rack and other implements of torture were used on poor unfortunate souls. It was a dark, damp, and evil smelling place lit only by the flicker of candles. I like that bit. <laughs> no sound of the cries of pain or anguish could be heard from outside those thick walls. Today, very little of its sinister past remains. It's an out gift shop. <laughs> Now my story at this point would not be complete if I did not mention the ravens of the Tower of London. These large black birds are a popular and familiar sight to the visitors. No one really knows how they came about being here. But there is a legend, and the legend tells us that should the ravens leave the Tower of London, it will crumble into dust and the monarchy shall fall. Well everybody knows this is medieval superstition and nonsense. But in the year 1660, King Charles II was asked permission from the Observer Royal to have the ravens removed. In those days, there was a large telescope on top of the White Tower, and the ravens kept on fouling the lens. Now the king didn't care whether they were here or not, until he heard about the legend. For you must remember, it was his father, King Charles I, who was executed on the orders of Oliver Cromwell. Now rather than risk the anger of destiny, he ordered the six ravens be held at the Tower of London forevermore. Today, thankfully, we still have six ravens here. Of course we're not superstitious. We've got two extra. <laughs> they looked after by myself and one of my young water colleagues known as the Raven Master. 
make me mad. Respect the way to Tauguy.